Let's see. I guess this is what we need to begin with. We've done, we've looked at the different periods of English translation. We looked at the first period that lasted from the year 450 to around 1100. That was bounded on both sides by the invasion of the Jutes and Angles and Saxons on the one hand in 450 in England, and the invasion of the Normans on the other hand. And that was a period characterized by Anglo-Saxon, the Anglo-Saxon language or Old English. And then we've been looking at the second period, which lasted from 1100 to 1500. That, again, is bounded on the two sides by, the first place, the Norman invasion, 1066, the Battle of Hastings, around 1100, and the invention of the printing press. And then, this morning, we're going to start with the third period, which extends from that date, 1500, down to the present time, which is characterized by modern English. Although over the centuries, the spelling of English has certainly been updated. An archaic language has passed off the scene, as you can tell from looking at a 1611 edition of the King James Bible and uh, a modern printing of that that you probably own now. Now notice that if I said that we're starting with the third period, um, that means we must be starting with 1500, but yet we finished with Wycliffe and Nicholas and Purvey last time, and that was way back in the end of the 1300s. So what goes on for this one and a half centuries that we must um, not talk about? Well, nothing. That's why we don't talk about nothing as far as English translations are concerned. There's a, there's a 75 year period, three quarters of a century, from 1450 to 1525, during which we have some of the most important changes in England, in Europe, pretty much in the world. We have great international changes of glacial proportions that moved across Europe that served just to remake the, the whole <coughs> picture of history. Nothing more is done in England for their Bible translations from the end of the 14th century. I think the last date we gave you was 1388 and the Wycliffe Purvey Bible. <coughs> Nothing is done from the end of the 14th, 1388, to the start or really the first quarter of the 16th century, the year 1525. So in other words, we have one and a half centuries things that seemed as though they were speeding up there in England with Wycliffe and all of his work and it just seemed like we would have a deluge of work come after him and we only have one and that's Purvey and Purvey was the secretary of Wycliffe so he's really associated or attached to him anyway so from 1388 to 1525 the end of the 14th to the first the end of the first quarter of the 16th century almost one and a half centuries one and one third centuries we don't have anything taking place in England, nothing at all, as far as Bible translations are concerned. Now, to understand why, to understand what's happening in England, <clears throat> and to understand what's happening on the continent as well, we've got to discuss, we could probably do more, but we'll stay with these three since they're the three largest. We've got to discuss three of the greatest events in history. We'll more or less discuss them in the, in the order of chronology. Now, what I want you to do is figure out what those three things are in order of chronology. As long as you can name them, I can teach about them. They're fairly easy, they're fairly easy to think of. But before you even say anything, just think of what we're talking about. Um, England is going to be passing out of this Middle English phase or phrase of their language into a modern English stage. We're talking about things that not only affect England, they do affect England, they're rather late in coming to England. England is kind of an island unto itself, as it were. And meanwhile, other things are happening on the continent. And by that we mean the, the continent of Europe. And things of such large proportion that they are just going to radically change everything. And we've talked about Wycliffe changing everything. Well, what Wycliffe did doesn't even compare with these three great events what it, just around the corner from the time of Wycliffe, some of them starting as, as, um, as early as, you know, 60, 70 years after Wycliffe's death. 
And it's this whole period of uh, one and a half centuries, a quiet period in England as far as Bible translation work is concerned, that separates the two great early figures in English translation, namely John Wycliffe and William Tyndall. William Tyndall doesn't, William Tyndall isn't born until over a hundred years after Wycliffe's death. A lot of people have those guys pictured as brothers or cousins or really close together. More than a century and a half separates their births. More than a century separates the death of Wycliffe and the birth of, John, of um, William Tyndall. So something must be going on in England, something must be go going on in Europe. So what's the first thing that's going on? I heard two things. Inquisition, printing press, Well, you got all three of them named. I don't know if you're going to ever get them in the right order, though. <laughs> the Renaissance. We'll start with the Renaissance. I'm sure you've heard of this term before. R-E-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E. -S -S -E. If you want to characterize it in a pithy saying, it would be a period of learning because to a very large degree, the strictures of Roman Catholicism had kept learning at a low tide. <coughs> the popes and the councils, and all the decrees that had come earlier over all these centuries had pretty much established all of truth. And since all of truth was already established, why study then? There, there's really no need to study, there's no need to learn, there's nothing new that you could learn uh, since all that ever will be discovered has been discovered and has already been passed down by the Roman Catholic Church. You have to understand that there is no division in this period of history between religion and politics. They just go together. Our country is what is, has made so famous the so-called separation of church and state, which is not even part of the Constitution, but we're certainly ones who have made that so famous. Uh, church history, let's move beyond the time of the Apostles, but church history from that time up until <coughs> relatively recent times, and really the founding of this country, um, church history has been characterized by a great intermixing <coughs> of religion and politics. And it certainly was the case throughout all of these centuries of the domination of Roman Catholicism. Um, there, were, there was just a great mixture between politics. And so, and so what I mean to imply by that is not only had the popes and the councils and so forth established religious truth, but those men were the teachers of the world. You didn't have uh, secular teachers, secular universities, um, secular programs of study. Uh, no one was really studying except the priest and, and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Therefore, they were the educated. They were the only educated people in the world. Uh, most of the kings were ignorant. Most of the leaders, the political leaders who, let's say, weren't a part of the clergy, and as a result, they had as, as their private tutor some important clergymen. And besides that, they were part of the system anyway. But these Roman Catholic leaders had not only established religious truth, but they had established truth about the universe, cosmology, about man, um, about politics, about everything about which man was to think. Had already been laid down, had already been established. Now that's something that in our independent, free wheeling and dealing Western society we can hardly even comprehend because we are brought up to think independently and to act independently and you don't have to believe what anybody tells you. You can believe whatever you want to believe. And that is relatively new. When I say relatively new, I mean since the time of the Renaissance, the last few hundred years. Prior to that, um, and again, like I say, it's hard for us to comprehend, but prior to that, you didn't have any thoughts of your own. When that was just the way things were done around you and no one else questioned what was going on, then you didn't question what was going on. I mean, a lot of people here in, in the United States didn't question what was going on until the decade of the 1960s. And then someone began pulling the wool over their eyes with Vietnam and then Watergate and, and then we have all these radicals on college campuses like Berkeley in California and they began chanting these anti-war slogans and burn down the establishment slogans and, and the media um, had been deceived by Washington for so long about all this business of um, uh, Vietnam and Watergate that we kind of came out of a shell here in this country and, 
and in some sense it's good, in some sense it's bad, and now we all think independently. And, you know, no one believes a politician. There were earlier days when, although politicians might not have been always truthful, they were certainly more truthful than they are today. And where the news media just reported what was going on. Now the news media tries to create what's going on by reporting things that aren't going on. And so by reporting that, you're creating something that wasn't happening prior to that. Well, a lot of that's due to Washington. It's really not the news media's fault. It's Washington's fault, lying to the country during the 1960s. And so we get all of these vibes from these radicals on college campuses that we're not supposed to believe what everyone tells us in. I mean, you, you remember the days of station wagons and PTA and dad worked nine to four and all of this. It was a good world. It was a good life, a good country, a good society. <laughs> But, you know, PTA, you get murdered if you go to a PTA meeting today. You get scalped, mugged, robbed, raped, or something like that. And uh, back in those days, that was the thing to do. All mothers went to PTA meetings. But see, this country has gone through a radical shift. And um, it's a re-renaissance again, gone through another period of learning and questioning and so forth. So for us, it's very difficult to really understand what it was like to live in this type of period prior to the renaissance not to have any independent thoughts about anything, for all of your ideas to be made up for. You see, education is not compulsory. That's only about 100 years old in this country, but education is not compulsory. No one goes to school unless you're sent off to become a priest or a, or a nun or you go to a monastery as a monk or something like that. Those were the only people who would have any need to go to school. And those people, and it's true in Roman Catholic schools today, what do you have? You have teachers who are not only religious teachers, but they teach English and science and mathematics and all of this. Well, that's what was going on here. <coughs> those men and those women knew not only religious topics, but they were also the teachers of one another and of new converts into their order of just regular worldly topics. Someone had to teach them. Now, the parents did some teaching, but they didn't know very much. These religious leaders knew all that was going on. But the 15th and the 16th centuries changed all of this. And I don't even propose to get into all of the whys. How did this just all of a sudden happen? I mean, you have to have some type of explanation. Um, I'm just going to give you some broad, general understandings of the Renaissance and, and of what happened because it, it's such a time of, um, of adventure, of invention, of um, daring worldwide travel. This is a time of men like Kepler, um, Galileo, Marco Polo, Columbus. All of these people lived during this time. Martin Luther, Erasmus, um, Thomas More, William Tyndall lived during this time, Francis Bacon, and, and people of like caliber. Now, probably the most important event that I could give you under the Renaissance and what, what caused the Renaissance to happen would be the fall of Constantinople to the Turks in the year 1453. But try to, as we go along with some of these dates and men, catch the flavor of the era as well. This is a time for all of these great men that I've just named and probably more that you could think of who lived during the same era. The fall of Constantinople in 1453. Now, for 1,100 years, Constantinople had been the center of Byzantine thought and culture. And almost 400 years to the day earlier, in the year 1054, the church at Constantinople had split from the Roman Catholic Church. It's remarkable, almost to the day, almost to the precise year, four centuries apart, we have the split between the Greek Orthodox Church in the Roman Catholic Church in 1054, and then the fall of Constantinople, which was really the basis headquarters for the Greek Orthodox Church 400 years later in 1453. <clears throat> and so those two dates, plus the date for the Norman invasion of England, are three very pivotal dates in world history. And especially those two in the 11th century are easy to confuse, so you need to remember which is which. 1066 is the Battle of Hastings, which changes England that we've discussed before. 
And just 12 years prior to that, 1054, the middle of the 11th century, the Greek Orthodox Church, and this is the whole story in itself, but the Greek Orthodox Church splits from the Roman Catholic Church. And they have been split from one another ever since then. That's been a thousand years ago, almost a thousand years ago. And that's why in the world today, you really have three great, what are they called, the three great branches of, branches of Christendom. You have the Roman Catholic Church, which is the oldest. Then you have the Greek Orthodox Church, which as a single entity begins in 1054. And you have the Protestant Church, which is the late sister in the family, which takes us way up in the beginning of the 16th century. 1517. Now, Constantinople uh, falls to the Turks. And what, do you th what do you think this causes? I mean, we're, all we're talking about is a city here. Well, we're talking about more than a city. We're talking about uh, an empire that Constantinople is controlling. You see, we've had, we've had a, that's, in 1054 is a formal split between the Eastern Orthodox, between the Eastern and the Western Church, as they're called, the Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox. Um, we've had them fighting one another for centuries prior to this time. It's not until certain final events, the straw that breaks the camel's back, as they say, occur before we actually have the final split in 1054. But then the city just goes on, uh, on its own, with the Greek Orthodox Church there and all of their metropolitans. You know, in, in Rome, they're called popes and bishops, and in the Greek Orthodox Church, they're called metropolitans. And they have all of their ecclesiastical leaders, and they have their centers of learning, Constantinople being the great center of learning then. And then it falls to the Turks. And you know, Turkey is just across the strait there from Constantinople. And the Turks have been the ones involved in all of those crusades going on down there in Jerusalem as well. So they've been going south as well as north, south first and now north. You know, you're through with all the crusades down in Jerusalem and Palestine, and now they go and they sack the city of Constantinople in the year 1453. Well, what does that cause to happen, though? Why, why would that bring a Renaissance period along? Well, we might even could say that the Greek Orthodox Church and the Eastern world there was somewhat more advanced in its learning than the Western world. The Western world had become extremely stagnant by this period of time because of the strictures of the Roman Catholic Church. So whenever Constantinople finally falls in 1453, then many of the scholars who reside in this city flee to the West lead to Rome, of course, the other great city in the world of that day. And they brought with them priceless knowledge and priceless manuscripts. Now, manuscripts I mentioned specifically because we're studying Bible translations. And they brought other things, priceless works of art and so forth as well, that would have been looted and burned and destroyed by the Turks had they been left behind. The Turks were obviously a non-Christian um, uh, barbaric group of people. They had no concern for learning or knowledge, no concern for some of these um, beautiful buildings in Constantinople, no concern for artwork or, or treasures of handiwork, no concern for biblical manuscripts for certain, or any type of writing, any type of manuscript there. So this would have all been destroyed. Much of it was, by the way, in Constantinople. But many of the scholars fled to the West. They knew that there's no haven around here anymore. There's, there's no haven in Turkey for us. The only haven we know of is if we flee to the West and we go to Rome, which is what they did. And they take all of their knowledge and their manuscripts and their learning with them. All right, now what this does then with the intrusion, the, the migration of all of these scholars from Constantinople over to Rome, it brings a revival of learning in Rome. And Rome, with the Catholic Church being headquartered there, is really the head and therefore what influences the rest of the continent as well as the British Isles, but the rest of the continent of Europe. And so that's really how we come about this great revival of learning. And notice it didn't come so much through the Roman Catholic Church. They were content to keep their people dumb and ignorant. It came through the scholars who had fled from the Eastern Orthodox Church, from Byzantium or Constantinople, or as it's known since 1932, I believe, Istanbul, fle fleeing over to the city of Rome. Revival of learning in such areas as Greek and Hebrew, 
which had long been absent from the West. Remember, Latin had taken over in the third century AD as the dominant important language of the West. Greek had been prior to that. Then one was in speaking, the other in writing. And then finally, a Latin takes over in both areas in the third century AD. We studied that way back with um, the Latin manuscripts. However, all this time, all of these hundreds of years in Constantinople or in Byzantium, um, Greek and Hebrew had continued to be studied, not in the West, but in the East. So whenever they come, here is part of that very important knowledge to bring Greek. Now, Greek, not only for Bible purposes, but think of all the other ancient writings, the important writings of literature. That, of course, had been translated into Latin, but that may have originally been in Greek. And so it was very important to know Greek for them. The first time ever that Greek was studied publicly in the West was in the year 1458. Now, that's no coincidence. Just five years after the fall of Constantinople, it's more than a coincidence. It's explained by the information I've just shared with you. The first time ever that Greek is studied publicly <coughs> was at the University of Paris in the West we're talking about. It was at the University of Paris in 1458. And of course, soon after that, it just spread everywhere. The first Greek and Hebrew Bibles and grammars and lexicons, as we'll see momentarily, in the West were soon coming forth as well. Now, this new interest in the original languages of Scripture naturally pushed the topic of Bible translations into the vernacular to the very forefront of people's thinking that <coughs> it's going to take X number of years, not that many, but some years for Greek and Hebrew to take on in the universities, to take root there, and for men in the West to be able to learn it. But meanwhile, while the scholars of the West are attempting to learn Greek and Hebrew, they're surrounded by scholars from the East who already know it, who can do any type of translating work that needs to be done because they are already familiar with the language. Of course, they come from the Greek area. That's why they obviously still speak Greek, whereas the people in Rome would speak Latin. So that's probably <clears throat> the most important thing that's taking place. Other things could have happened and did happen after this, but uh, to a certain extent, they were influenced by the Renaissance, <clears throat> and they could never have carried the tide of the change as far as it was carried, as we'll see, if the Renaissance hadn't preceded some of these other events that took place. Okay, the second great thing that we must discuss that was also mentioned was the invention of the printing press. <coughs> Am I going too fast for some of you? Okay, was the invention of the printing press. Now let's look at our dates again. Constantinople falls in 14, um, 1453. A couple of years later, Greek is studied for the first time in Paris and things begin to start um, snowballing after that. When was the printing press invented? 14? 54. Now, that's no coincidence either. Look how close these dates are together. You'll see how there's such a connection. Everything is overlapping and intertwining with something else. Constantinople Falls, the year before, 1453, all these scholars come over to the west, away from where the Turks are, where they're controlling now. 1454, the very next year, the printing press is invented by Gutenberg, remember, in Mainz, Germany, and the first thing that rolls off of it is a single sheet indulgence. And then just a couple of years later, in 1456, he gave us the so-called Gutenberg Bible <coughs> in Mainz, Germany. And I've told you this story several times before, so I'm not going to go into it again. But think of this in light of Bible <coughs> translation now. Speed, accuracy, <coughs> cheap cost involved of having manuscripts, of ha no longer manuscripts, of having books in your hands now. And that just happens to come. You see, the Renaissance really starts all of this off, but then you've got to kind of have the printing press to go along with it to really have a revival of learning. Yeah. Because learning can only be spread so far if everything that's ever written is done by hand. If everything that is on a page somewhere is done by hand, that's a very, very slow process. It's um, open to many errors, <coughs> copyist errors. 
Um, it's a very costly process as well to sit down and hand copy. I don't care whether it's something from Julius Caesar or, or something from Matthew or John. It can be sacred or secular material. It's going to be very expensive to try to obtain something like that because it all has to be written by hand. So if we want this tide of learning to be carried, you know, another few feet further, then we're going to have to have something else, which is the invention of the printing press. And as it relates to Bible translations, I guess particularly, we would think of things like speed and uh, the cheap cost of the material as well as the accuracy. With the speed, with the printing press and the speed, you can just have books and books and books kicked off of the press. Nothing like we can have today, by the way. They didn't have presses like we have today, but still, speed. It's not going to take you weeks and months to write something. It's going to be accurate because you have type, and once type is made, it's there. Now, if you make the type wrong, it's going to make the book wrong, but once the type is there, at least it'll be always wrong. It'll be always wrong in the same place. Whereas with scribal writing, you don't ever know where it's going to be wrong. You misspell the first word, and I misspell the second one, and your brother misspells the ninth one, and we got all these confusing manuscripts. At least we'll have all the manuscripts that misspell just the first word, and they'll all look the same. So we're basically, we're going to have something accurate, something cheap because of the other things that I just said, basically the speed. We don't have all of this hand labor involved, then the manuscripts will be cheap. Let's look first of all at the Greek language and watch what happened so quickly here. It's invented in 1454. <clears throat> we have our first Greek grammar in 1476. That is, first printed one that rolls off the press, 1476. We have our first Greek lexicon in 1492. Our first Bible is printed, the Bible of Cardinal Jimenez in 1514. Now you see, that took over half a century. <coughs> we have our first Bible published. Printing and publishing are two different things. In 1516, by Erasmus. So we've got a grammar in 1476, a lexicon in 1492, a Bible printed, 1514, a Bible published, 1516, by Erasmus. And then Erasmus gives us other editions. We're talking about the Greek Bible, the Greek New Testament. He gives us other editions in 1519, in 1522, 1527, 1535. One of these early ones served as the basis for Luther's German New Testament in 1522. And one of these also served as the basis for Tyndall's English New Testament done in 1525. That was Erasmus' third edition. That was the basis of Tyndall's work. So now you've got, because we have Greek manuscripts available, because these were brought over from Constantinople, <laughs> and now we have the printing press available, therefore we can give us Greek printed New Testaments now. They're no longer manuscripts. You, don't, you only call handwritten things manuscripts. Now these are books now. We have printed work that's done. Now we can take that work that's in the Greek and we can take it to all the other vernacular tongues of the continent, as well as the British Isles. And, and Luther uses some of the work of Erasmus. They live right during the same period of history to give us his German New Testament in 1522 and then Tyndall to give us his English New Testament in 1525, which was the third edition of Erasmus that Tyndall used to give us his in 1525. And that's why we end up with our heavenly witness passage over there in 1 John, remember. And then as far as the Hebrew language is concerned, the first thing we're given in Hebrew is kind of the reverse of, um, of Greek is the Bible, which of course means the Old Testament. In 1488, <clears throat> now this is the first complete one, first complete Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament, printed book. 1488. Now, the earliest portion of Scripture was done either in the year 1477 or 1482. But that's just a portion of the Old Testament in Hebrew, printed either in 1477 or in 1482. 
Then we have our first Hebrew grammar in 1503. See, if they start giving us grammars, now we can teach students because they have a grammar to use, a grammar book. 1503. We have our first lexicon in 1506. Didn't take long, even though it's a half a century plus for some of this to happen. Some of it was a lot earlier than that. It didn't take long. Now, remember that that Bibles really could hardly be done, could hardly be hand copied, individual private copies for the common man out there. Because A, many times they might not be able to read the word, and B, even if they could read it, they couldn't afford it, probably. And so although we've talked about Bibles being done, so-called being done for the common man, the Lawlers took them around and preached out of them, taught out of them, read from them to the people. Because you couldn't actually hand copy all these Bibles and distribute them out to people. The cost would just be prohibitive and the time would just be insurmountable. But now that we have the printing press, now these types of works, Hebrew, Greek, whatever, whatever you want, take it from that into the vernacular language, which is what's going to happen in this long process here, it could be available for every man then. Now, they were still semi-expensive, Probably we could say expensive in comparison to what we have to pay for book today, although let me tell you about buying books. They can be expensive buying them today. But still, you can buy a book for five dollars, you know. I mean, and that's not like, um, well, it's, it's such a small percentage of your yearly income that, or your monthly income, you know, to spend four dollars on a book that it's really not even a percentage point there. Whereas back then, maybe you'd spend five percent. I probably spend that on my books, but I mean what you would buy or what just the average man would want to buy, a copy of the Bible. It's like a certain percentage of his yearly income, but at least you could afford it. At least it wasn't five years worth of income to buy one book. At least you could buy it, which is going to just change the world. Yeah. Think of the books that are available. I mean, if it was said in Solomon's day of the making of books, there is no end, and all those were done by hand, then think how that has to be multiplied a million, trillion fold by today. Amen. That was said way back in Solomon's day. They were all copied by hand. They weren't books, they were scrolls anyway. The making of scrolls, there is no end. Well, there were maybe a couple of hundred of them available somewhere in Israel. But just think of the books that are available now, today. I mean, and the, the bad ones that you never even hear about, the ones that are printed and then burned because they're no good or something, they never sell any copies and the publisher doesn't carry them anymore. Think of the untold number of books that are available, all because of the printing press. And thanks to Gutenberg, available to you at an affordable price, that you can uh, pick them up yourself. And then we come to a third thing. All of this happening in the same period of history. Three great events that go bam, bam, bam in order that changed the world is the Reformation. <coughs> the Renaissance, the printing press, and the Reformation. Sixty years after the invention of the printing press in November of 1515, a Roman Catholic monk and scholar by the name of Martin Luther began a series of lectures to his students at the University of Wittenberg in Germany based on the Book of Romans. Now for the next four years as this Roman Catholic monk and scholar Luther, named after one of the early saints, Martin, as he began to prepare these lectures and teach them to his students, a light began to come on in his mind. He was just a typical run-of-the-mill Roman Catholic scholar. And this light began to show him how inconsistent the Roman Catholic doctrine of salvation was. That's really what Luther saw. That was the first thing that he saw. How inconsistent and insufficient, we might add, the Roman doctrine of salvation was. Inconsistent, that is, with Paul's teaching, the book of Romans on justification. <coughs> and over, this, over these next four years, from 1515 to 1519, from the fall of one year to the fall of the next, 
Martin Luther began to see more and more that salvation as it was taught in Scripture came through faith in Jesus Christ and not through the purchase of papal indulgences. Now the selling of papal indulgences was at its height right during this period of time because St. Peter's was being built in Rome. And the Pope used the selling of papal indulgences to bankroll St. Peter's construction. Now, Martin Luther didn't think that was really fair, <laughs> to say the least. To be selling people forgiveness of their sins so you could build an edifice down in Rome. He just found that to be very inconsistent. To be devious, to be um, covetous, to be greedy, to be everything that the Pope shouldn't stand for, selling people papal indulgences, the forgiveness of their sins, to bankroll the construction of St. Peter's in Rome. He didn't think that was right. But more than that, what he thought that was right was salvation came through faith in Jesus Christ, that a man was justified by faith and not by works. And works would include such things as going out and buying a papal indulgence. And he had a particular foe whose name was Tetzel, T-E-T-Z-E-L, I believe. But he had a particular foe whose name was Tetzel who was selling indulgences right across the little river that separated one diocese, or whatever they would call it, from the one over which Martin Luther was set, and some of his people were crossing over the river to get the, because he wasn't selling them anymore, was crossing over the river to get those indulgences from Tetzel because he was sent out from Rome to sell these to raise money to build St. Peter's in Rome. And of course, Luther didn't like that. First of all, he's losing his sheep to this, well, what he thinks is a false prophet, you know, across the river selling these, these um, papal indulgences. And then, of course, he saw that from that, uh, whatever he could teach his people, whatever he could teach his young men, his students um, at the University of Wittenberg would do no good because they would come and, you know, pay lip service to what their teacher was giving them while meanwhile their life was wrapped up in buying indulgences from, from Tetzel. Well, Martin Luther's mind after a period of a couple of years, notice that we're talking about several years this is the development before his, um, before his mind is changed. It doesn't just happen. You don't just all of a sudden wake up one day and think, well, you get saved by faith today. And all my past life, I've been lost the whole time. So it comes to a head in October 1519, the last day of the month, where Luther tacked his 95 theses to the door of the little local chapel and started a fire that's never been stopped since. Whenever we study that sometime, we'll go over his 95 theses. But most of them have to do with erroneous Roman Catholic doctrine, particularly as it relates to justification, imputation, salvation, works, things of this nature. Just different ways of rewriting and different points that need to be stressed. And that's why we have 95 theses. And I'm sure you've heard that little story before, mm -hmm. how he tacks him to the door of the little chapel in Wittenberg, Germany. And there's some more to that, but that's how it's stereotyped, and that makes it easy for you to remember. Now, Luther laid a great emphasis. I think I mentioned this in an earlier teaching, but Luther laid a great emphasis on the priesthood of the believer. I want to show you how all of this ties together, so get this down and listen to this. Now, the priesthood of every believer meant individual responsibility. Now, individual responsibility happens to be an, a very appropriate theme to find itself being developed right in the middle of the Renaissance. So see how there's an overlapping of all of this. Individual responsibility, the priesthood of the believer, well, that was just unheard of and not thought of prior to the Renaissance. But the Renaissance puts an emphasis on the common man, on every man, because we're going to learn, we get all these scholars over, and the printing press makes learning available to us in our own language. We have scholars who can translate, we have printing press that can give us the books, we can afford them, we can learn, therefore I don't have to believe what I'm told anymore. I can read with my own two eyes, I can understand with my own mind what I'm reading, and then I'll make my judgment after that. Well, this whole business of Martin Luther, and some people 
some liberal church historians try to interpret all of this <laughs> on such a historical, sociological basis that, you know, they don't see any spiritual import to it at all. But there is a historical and sociological import to this, so it just happens, and I think within the providence of the timing of God, to all be brought forth at this time. If Martin Luther brought forth this business about the priesthood of every believer and individual responsibility prior to the Renaissance, prior to the invention of the printing press, but for the power of God, I don't know that it would have gone over very well. It just wasn't time for it. But since now for 60 years, you already have people thinking individually. You already have them thinking on their own. It's kind of time for something like this to come along. I just think that's yet another place where we see God's hand in human history. Human history is not just a fortuitous accident or um, an evolutionary chain of events that takes place, but it's, it's controlled either very directly or very indirectly by, by God and by his providence so that everything happens at the right time. Now, this emphasis on the individual by Luther and the priesthood of the believer couldn't help but forward the cause of vernacular translations of the Bible. You see, each one of these things would forward that cause. The Renaissance, because you need to read, you need to study, you need to learn. The printing press, now it's available. Martin Luther, now he tells you that from the mind of God, it's allowed of you to. Some people are still afraid of that who have been brought up in the Roman Catholic Church. And now he's telling them to their conscience, that your conscience um, can, can be soothed because it's okay, because this is what God wants you to do, to be able to read the scriptures on your own, in your own tongue, in your own language, and to be able to think about these matters and decide about these matters for yourself. Now, granted, this is a rather general presentation of these three topics, but I think that the events themselves really affected um, the Bible translations of the continent and at a more distant, in a more distant time affected the, the changes in Bible translation that take place in England as well. So let me go on and discuss some things about England and I guess I'll call this the conclusion. Um, I don't know how far I'll get. These were supposed to be two separate messages but I thought I might try to join them today if I have time to breeze through all of this. So, England, remember, is an island. It's an island in the distance of the Reformation. The Reformation really made a late call on England and her people. Uh, by the year 1500, by the year 1500, most languages of Europe already have a New Testament. This isn't due to Luther, this is due to the printing press and the Renaissance. Already have a New Testament or an entire Bible translated for them and printed in many copies. England, however, would have to wait for another quarter of a century. Now, England's got scattered handwritten copies, Wycliffe's two Bibles, Nicholas of Hereford and John Purvey, but the Constitutions of Oxford are still in effect, which, of course, forbid the reading or the translating of scripture into the vernacular tongue. <coughs> there is an Englishman by the name of William Caxton who set up his printing shop at Westminster in 1476. Now that's fairly quickly to be that far away from Germany and the invention of the printing press and to already have his own printing shop at Westminster in England. William Caxton, C-A-X-T-O-N. He's not a very important name. We'll get to some important ones here in a moment. But he was a scholar in his own right. And from his press came many different works, including those of Chaucer. He was always looking around, trying to find something to translate for the people. Because he did have the ability to translate, and once he translated it, since he also was a printer and owned a printing shop, then he could print the work for them. But a Bible was one thing that never came from his press in English. The constitutions of Oxford are still in effect, remember, and I'm sure that it had something to do with it, as well as the Tudor dictatorship might explain why. But he did give us an English translation of an ancient Latin work called The Golden Legend. And in this, 
we're going to end up with some portions of the Bible in English. Printed, that means the first time any part of the Bible is printed in English. It's done by William Caxton, found in the Golden Legend, originally written in Latin. What was that work? It was a work on the lives of important saints. Some of them were biblical and some of them were not. But the history of the lives of those from Bible days would naturally come from the Bible itself. So that in that manner he would actually give portions of the Bible. Some in the New Testament, almost all of Genesis, many famous Bible figures there, the patriarchs, of course, and part of the book of Exodus. So the only minor important thing about Caxton is the fact that this was the first printed work in English from the Bible, the first printed work in English from the Bible. But it's not, it's not the Bible as such, remember. It's, it's a Latin work, the golden legend that tells stories of the saints. But when one of those saints happens to be a biblical saint, then to tell the story about them, you have to use biblical material. And it was all in Latin, of course, originally in the Golden Legend, so he just translated it from Latin into English. So in a sneaky roundabout way, he bypassed those constitutions of Oxford because he wasn't printing a Bible. And he knew that this was taking place. He wasn't printing a Bible. He was printing the Golden Legend. But found in the Golden Legend were parts of the Scripture. But it doesn't seem like that was that effective because people weren't just going to their local bookstore and buying a copy of the Golden Legend so they could read the book of Genesis. So it really wasn't that effective. As far as the Renaissance and all these changes are concerned in England, we're going to turn to three other men, three other representatives of the movement here that are the ones who have the most profound effect on England. Okay, now you guessed in the earlier portion of this message the three important events in history, the Renaissance, the printing press, and the Reformation. Now it's time to guess who these three men were. Three, as far as the Renaissance in England is concerned, England is a long way from where the Renaissance um, starts. It's over there where it finishes, and so it takes a long time to reach that. And the Reformation and even the printing press, although that comes relatively early, just a couple of decades after it was actually invented. But England has her representatives too. King James. King James. John Calvin. Some of you people need a lesson in church history. <laughs> okay, James was from England, but of course James lives about a century after this time before he comes to the throne. Um, Calvin is a Frenchman, although he does most of his living in Switzerland, in Geneva. That's where his basis is. Thomas More, definitely Thomas More. Uh, Thomas More is one of the greatest of English political hyphen religious figures of all time. He's the one who wrote the book Utopia. That's still in print today. He's the one writing during these times of Thomas Hobbes, um, Leviathan, these other great works that are coming out. Of course, those are non-Christian, secular type works, and Thomas More is a Roman Catholic, and he writes the book Utopia that is still in print today. Who else would you guess? Okay, Coverdale, he's certainly very important, but um, oh, he's a brilliant scholar in his own right, and he's the man we'll discuss who actually does the translation work. But he doesn't rank as high as these, these other three men. I don't think you're going to guess these others, because you, one of them you've heard of, but he's not an Englishman. It's just that he comes to England several times and really influences England. Well, Thomas More is the first one we'll discuss. John Collet is the second one, C-O-L-E-T. And Erasmus is the third. Erasmus, someone says. Thought he was from Holland. Well, he was. So we'll see what we have to say about him in a moment. Okay, we'll start with Sir Thomas More. Now, how many of you have heard of Sir Thomas More? M-O-R-E. Have you? I heard of him. Well, I mean, heard of him. At least you've heard of him. I mean, you might not be friends with John Dillinger, but at least you've heard of him and Jesse James and the rest of them. Okay, so a few of you. How I many of you ever heard of Utopia? The book Utopia. All right, see, several people have heard of that. All right, that's his most famous work, and that's what has made him most famous down to this day. 
is his work Utopia. You can probably find it in a bookstore somewhere. He's a Roman Catholic, moves up the political religious ladder very quickly in England, but because of a, a whole series of events, he falls out of favor with the king and he's finally executed as a martyr. That's just some of his other history. If we were studying him, we'd look at his whole biography. But we want to see what, how he's important regarding the Renaissance recording and regarding Bible work that's done in England. Okay, in 1529. Oh, let me give you his years. He lived 1480 to 1535. 1480 to 1535. In 1529, he published a work entitled A Dialogue Concerning Heretics. A Dialogue Concerning Heretics. Which took to task William Tyndall, who had recently translated his Bible four years previously. This is what the work is really all about, a dialogue concerning heretics, which shows that although later in his life he fell out of favor with the king and was executed as a martyr, uh, at this time he still has very strong Roman Catholic beliefs. Or he wouldn't have been such a foe of William Tyndall. He considered William Tyndall to be a heretic, in other words. But he also mentions in this book, and I quote, the great arch-heretic Wycliffe, <laughs> which, bless his heart, had been dead for 145 years by this time. <laughs> But he thought that it was his initial work that had led to the ban in the Constitutions of Oxford, so he stuck his name in here among the heretics as well. But the great arch heretic was Wycliffe. Now, the ban is still in effect. The Constitutions of Oxford are still in effect. But Thomas More tells us that the ban didn't include all Bibles. Now, this is an interesting historical tidbit that we get from his writings, this a dialogue concerning heretics. I'll give you a rather lengthy quotation from this. Moore writes, Myself have seen and can show you. He's, he's an Englishman writing in England during this time. We're not supposed to have Bibles. There's a ban on them according to the Constitutions of Oxford, which were passed after Wycliffe's work in death. Myself have seen and can show you Bibles, fair and old, written in English, which have been known and seen by the bishops of the diocese and left in layman's hands and women's to such as he knew for good and Catholic folk. But of truth, all such as are found in the hands of heretics, they used to take away. Hmm, what can we say about these? We already said this last time. Remember, they really allowed the people to have a Bible on their coffee table if they wanted to, as long as it was a good and faithful Roman Catholic. Then they thought that to get into the Scriptures would only make you believe the priests that you go to hear every Mass time even more. But if you're a heretic and you get into the Bible and you go hear the priest at Mass time, you'll believe him even less then, according to their definition of a heretic, because you're going to start questioning and challenging all of these things. So Thomas More actually gives us our statement that gives us the information that I shared uh, really prematurely, but it was appropriate last time, that although this ban was instituted with the Constitutions of Oxford, still Bibles were being done in English, and these were Wycliffe Bibles, probably Purvey Bibles and not the Nicholas of Hereford ones, but these Bibles were being done. Roman Catholics owned them, but they were good, faithful Catholic folk, as we're told by More, which probably meant they were upper class as well. To be able to afford this, they were probably um, in good standing with the local bishop or the local priest, and therefore he knew them well, and he would allow them to actually own a Bible. So Thomas More is one who greatly influences what's going on. Then a second man. I'm having to shorten this and talk quickly. No normally I elaborate. You probably think too much I elaborate, but I elaborate on these things. I don't have time today because I'm trying to put four pages, two messages into one this morning. And that's John Collet, C-O-L-E-T, who lived 1467 to 1519. Now he is one of the first and the greatest influences of the Renaissance in England. 
He became Dean of St. Paul's in London in 1505. But before this, he had taken a long journey to Europe, returning to Oxford in the year 1496, where he delivered a series of studies and lectures on the Pauline epistles, majoring on, which one do you think he majored on? Romans. Romans. Now, where he got his ideas were, of course, on the continent, but not from Luther. Luther is a little bit after this time. See, Luther is the one big figure that we all think of. We think of the Reformation. But there are many men in the same period of time, just a little bit previously, and maybe a one and a half, one and a quarter centuries previously, such as Wycliffe, who had many of these same notions. Just that Luther probably did the most as far as a reformer was concerned, and, and his name has been passed along as such. But he travels in Europe and he learns and studies some things when he returns to Oxford, the end of the 15th century, 1496. Then he begins teaching his students, lecturing on the Pauline epistles, and he majors on the book of Romans. And what John does, and this is what's important to remember about him, is as he went from chapter 1 through the book of Romans, he based his interpretation on the obvious sense of the passage. You say, well, what's new about that? Well, that was the, one of the first and one of the great breaks from the allegorical method of interpretation that had prevailed for well over a thousand years previous to this. It's a revolutionary change in Bible study. For instance, if you sit down and you try to read, let's say, the book of Exodus, and Pharaoh means something, and Egypt means something, and Moses means something, and the burning bush means something, and the mountain means something, and the plagues mean something. Uh, pretty soon you don't have anything there in the book of Exodus anymore. All you have are these far-fetched allegorical meanings that you have associated with this. And so what the mountain really means is, you know, the, 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 the greatness of God. And so you start reading about the greatness of God and what the writer of Exodus is talking about is a literal mountain, a real, literal, not flesh and blood, but rock and stone mountain that's actually there, that's probably still there today. And yet they didn't read Scripture that way. That was not the way you interpreted Scripture. You interpreted it allegorically. And John is the first one who comes back to England and really gives us the sense interpretation of the passage. That if Paul's talking about justification by faith, that's what he means. He's not talking about justification by works. If, if a certain passage is talking about the condemnation of the Gentiles, that's what it's talking about. Not the people who live in France, anyone who's a Gentile. If, if the writer's talking about the patriarch Abraham, that's who he means. Not, well really he's talking about the Apostle Peter. And when he talks about Peter, really he's talking about the Pope in Rome. No, what he's talking about is what he's talking about. That prepares them for the need of having Bibles around as well. And then the third and the last figure we'll discuss this morning. So we've gone through six things then. The Renaissance, the printing press, the Reformation, Thomas, John, Erasmus, 1466 to 1536. Fourteen sixty six, fifteen thirty six. Perhaps the best known of all of these men. We're well, definitely best known here in the church because we've taught about Erasmus before. But maybe even just best known of anyone who would have heard of these three men, and probably Thomas More would be second. Or for some Thomas More would be first, and Erasmus would be second. Now Erasmus is not an Englishman. He's from Holland. He's a Dutch humanist. And whenever we use the term humanist during this period of time, we don't use it in the sense we would use it today. A humanist meant a renaissance man, a human, one who believed in human advancement, human culture, human learning, human improvement, a humanist. And of course, you could say, well, that's what a humanist is today, but it certainly has an anti-God, an anti-supernatural bent today that it didn't have then. But that is a little catchphrase by which many people remember Erasmus, that he was a Dutch humanist. If you were asked to describe him, you might have already used that phrase yourself because I've used it so many times, a Dutch humanist. But remember, a humanist then is not like a humanist today. He just talks about a human, thinks that humans are good, advancement of humans and so forth. 
But he also was a biblical scholar and not a liberal one either. Although he and Luther did have some problems, he certainly was not as conservative orthodox as Luther. No, he's not an Englishman. He's from Holland. So how does he influence England? Well, he makes several important visits to England. Now, a lot of people don't know this, that Erasmus traveled and made some very important visits to England. His first visit was in 1499 to Oxford, where he met both of the two men that we've just discussed. The latter of those, John, profoundly influenced Erasmus and the way he, from then on afterwards, interpreted scripture. He had followed the allegorical method just like everyone else had, Erasmus. And John profoundly influenced him so that Erasmus began to interpret scriptures. Methods of Bible interpretation, in other words, were changed after his first visit in 1499 um, to England, to Oxford, um, by the last man that we just discussed. His second visit was in 1506. And then here's where it gets interesting, and we'll conclude with this. His third visit was in 1511. This was his most important visit, as well as his longest. Because he remained at Cambridge, this time, as a visiting professor of Greek and divinity. Sometimes it's, we have such stereotypes of these people in this day, we think of them as, as just a great figure, and, we, and we, don't, we don't think of them as a human being. But he was a man who, who made a living. He was a professor. He was a scholar. Just like you have scholars that travel around today from one university to another, and they are a visiting lecturer, visiting professor, or distinguished visiting professor in archaeology or whatever. Well, he was a distinguished visiting professor of Greek and divinity at Cambridge University. Now, during his stay at Cambridge, he did much study in Jerome and in the New Testament. There's two things that he happened to be concentrating on in his own life then. I'm concentrating on Bart's 10,000 pages of material right now. So during different times in a person's life, you concentrate on something. I finished Barbara Streisand, by the way, and I'm glad I'm through with it. <laughs> But I was doing Bart while I was doing Streisand, which, oh, what a combination. <laughs> That's why I'm also reading my Bible, meanwhile. <laughs> and some other good conservative commentaries. Now I'm going to start some of John Steinbeck's writings back in the Depression years. But anyway, this is what he was concentrating on, Jerome and the New Testament. Um, and I think it was, it was during this time of his life that he really laid the preparation for all of these Greek editions of the Bible that were to be soon forthcoming. Remember I just gave you that earlier? He gave us this one, 15, 16, I believe the first to be published, and then 15, 18, 15, 22, gave us all these Greek editions of the Bible. Well, he had time enough as a visiting professor here. You lecture a little bit and study the, the rest of the time. You don't have any ties anywhere because it's not home. You're just visiting. You're on vacation for a couple of years. This time he used for his preparation that paved the way for all of his Greek editions of the New Testament that were to come. So you can see, now he's met both of these earlier men that we just mentioned. So you can see again, not only do we have an interplay and an interworking of some of these events, the Renaissance, the printing press, the Reformation, but of the men involved here as well. They know one another, they're friends, they discuss things, they talk about scholarly issues and questions. And they influence one another. And so far it's been influenced for the better because Erasmus has certainly been influenced for the better in his methods of Bible interpretation. Now, the, the next man that we're going to discuss, and I'm just going to say a thing or two about him this morning as we conclude, is William Tyndall, T-Y-N-D-A-L-E. Probably the three great names that most people remember with English, early English Bible translations are Wycliffe, Tyndall, and Coverdale. So we'll speak about William Tyndall. William Tyndall was a student at, where would you guess? Cambridge. So then we would ask ourselves that very interesting, tempting question. Did he sit under the teachings and lectures of Erasmus? 
Well, that'd be exciting if that situation were true, to think that he actually sat in the teaching of Erasmus. Erasmus was a tremendously knowledgeable Greek professor. I mean, to be writing all these Greek Bibles, you know what type of knowledge he had of the Greek New Testament. And what a benefit that would have been for Tyndall to be there. Well, evidently the facts just don't arrange themselves appropriately enough to have these two men's period of time overlapping one another. Erasmus stays at Cambridge from 1511 to 1514. We know that. But we know that, that Erasmus taught at Cambridge for four years, from 1511 to 1514. We don't know when Tyndall got to Cambridge, but we know that it could not have been any earlier than 1516. Could have been a little bit after that. But we know it couldn't have been any earlier from other events in his life and so forth. That meant that at the most they would have missed one another by three years and at the least they would have missed one another by one year depending on whether that 14th year and that 16th year are full years, half years, partial years or what. The most they miss one another by three years and at the least they miss one another by a year or you might just want to look at the dates and say they miss one another by two years. I guess that would be a safe way of saying it. But that's not to say that Erasmus didn't influence Tyndall. Because although Erasmus was gone by the time he came, Tyndall came, Erasmus must have greatly influenced all the other people there at Cambridge, both students who would later sometimes become teachers, as well as his fellow professors around there. So I, it certainly would be correct and safe to say that Erasmus probably had a, a great indirect influence on William Tyndall through the other teachers and the other students at Cambridge although it does, just does not appear that Erasmus could actually have been the teacher of Tyndall and Tyndall sat at his feet as a student. But he certainly influenced him because Tyndall followed his footsteps just a couple of years after that. What England needs to, to gather together the benefits of the Renaissance, of the invention of the printing press, as well as the Reformation. You see, a Roman Catholic wouldn't be doing this. It has to be someone who is of Reformed beliefs. England needs someone who can gather those together, a man of superior intellectual traits, a man of, of great physical stamina, because as we saw with, um, with Wycliffe, times can be difficult. You can be fired from your positions and so forth. And of course, that man that England found and was blessed with was William Tyndall. And we'll be starting with Tyndall the next time. Now, is there anything I need to go over with all of that? I know that was a lot of material this morning. I've got four typed pages, so that ought to give you about 16 in your notes there. But you probably missed some things. That's why you only have two pages. No. No. Industrial Revolution's 200 years after this. But I don't know that we'd have the Industrial Revolution without the Renaissance and without the invention of the printing press which showed us some mechanical abilities and some mechanical acumen of these men of this period. Because that's what the Industrial Revolution is all about, being able to mass produce these things. That takes machines. Well, I'm sure the man who, the people who could make a printing press could make other types of things with their hands, besides just tacking boards together, could make things out of metal, a lot of which had not been done prior to this time. Industrial Revolution is what hits France, and then it is carried on up into England later on. That's up into the 1700s, though. 1700s, and then on into the 1800s as well. No, the Renaissance starts really in southern Europe, because we have the people that come from Constantinople over to Rome. So it really starts in southern Europe, and then it spreads quickly throughout all of Europe reaching England, which on a map would be way over here, with, with Rome being down here and Constantinople being over here. England would be separated by the English Channel. <coughs>